It's great to have you here on the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you so you make better financial decisions in your life. So, you need some empowerment? We provide one-on-one free advice, something we've been doing since 1993, available to you 30 hours each week. You can talk with a member of Team Clark. When you have a question, a problem, a concern, you just don't know what to do or how to do it, go to clark.com slash CAC to see. Right, talk about something that we don't know how to do that could save us, depending whether you're buying for an individual, a couple, or a family, 1000 to $1,500 a year. First, who couldn't benefit? from having an extra $1,000 to $1,500 a year back in your life, almost all of us are way overpaying for our mobile phone service, our cell phone service. And we have been working for months to develop a decision-making tool that we now have available to you at Clark.com. And we will continue to refine it and improve it over time too that allows you to put in what you spend now what you use in terms of data whether you travel a lot outside the country all those variables and then we will show you all the alternatives that are available different plans different companies that can dramatically lower the cost of one of your monthlies that is so confusing what we're paying for it and why we're paying so much and this is especially urgent now with AT&T, Verizon and T-Mobile pushing rates up, 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 up. So if you go to clark.com slash phone plan finder, you'll see where we make it incredibly easy for you to put in some inputs, you might have to go Look at your account online to see how much data you're actually using on each line so that you get good information back. But you get that information back and you will be stunned how much money you can save staying on the same network you're already on or even if if you're willing to change networks, even changing networks to save a ton. So the whole idea of what we're trying to do at Clark.com is have more and more simplified decision-making guides where you can take something that a corporation is trying to make complicated and shut you down with complexity and simplify your decision-making so you can have the same service you already have or similar of whatever it is, but for a lower price. So, I want to talk now about some changes with retirement plans. And later, I want to talk about something you need to know at a time of so much change going on in the insurance industry, something you need to know to protect your wallet. So speaking of your wallet with retirement, there's a change that I am so excited about for all of us who have part-time gig somewhere, which is somewhere, depending on whose stats you believe, a quarter to a third of us, and then people that are self-employed as what they do. And it can be either situation or both. Because reality, when people work for a big company, they overwhelmingly save for their future. I mean, the, the mandatory enrollment that so many employers use now, like we do for our employees, I automatically enroll people, and then I match what they contribute, and we enroll them uh, automatically to 6%, and then I match the 6%, so I've got my employees, if they do nothing, saving 12% of their pay effectively. And apparently that is the standard kind of number, according to Vanguard, that when employers auto-enroll people, 
that their effective saving for the future is 12% of their pay. On the other hand, you look at people that are self-employed. Overwhelmingly, they don't save a single penny for retirement. It is rare that they save money for retirement. Someone who works for uh, an employer who doesn't offer retirement plans, plans, generally, they're not saving any money for retirement either. So Congress, in its wisdom, did something I'm excited about. There is what is known as a SEP, Simplified Employee Pension, which anybody, pretty much anybody, with a side gig or with your own business is now given extra incentive to set up a retirement plan for themselves. So with a SEP, the paperwork that you have to fill out takes about 90 seconds and you're done. And you then fund what instantly becomes essentially your own IRA. But the contribution limits are wonderful because they're based on you being able to take uh, nearly a quarter of what you earn from a side gig or from your own self-employed business and put it into a retirement account that now can go into either a Roth or go into a traditional. Prior, it could only go into traditional. But now having the ability, starting in January, to do this as a Roth gives an extra incentive for you to participate in a retirement plan. Because you don't want to be in a position where you dread getting older, possibly not being as healthy, and you're wondering how you're going to pay for things because it just never happened for whatever reason that you were saving money for retirement. So having this new tool of being able to do a Roth SEP, or if you work at a place that has a simple, there's nothing simple about a simple, but if you work somewhere that has a simple, you now have the Roth option as well for next year. And this is good, good, good stuff that I am just ecstatic about. But mandatory enrollment of employees. As somebody who has so many libertarian leanings, how could I be happy about that paternalistic thing of mandatory enrollment? Because I know that if my employees don't save for retirement, that they're going to be in a really insecure place later in life. Well, it's so, not yes, mandatory. It's well, automatic. It's automatic enrollment. So somebody can back out. Right. What's cool about automatic enrollment is people think of it as mandatory and they stay in. Right. And yes. then if they really are industrious, they can go past the 6% that... I automatically enroll them and the 6% match and they can put more in and create even more financial independence later in life. How about it? Love it. Okay. Mario in North Carolina says, I've never had much money, but have built up my Roth 401k to $75,000 at age 32. I'm taking a new job with a dramatic raise that will disqualify me to contribute to a Roth as a parishioner of the Church of Roth. To a Roth IRA. Right. Yeah, because they have a Roth 401 Roth IRA, yes. As a parishioner of the Church of Roth, I was hoping you could guide me. I still want to live on less than I make, so I want to save in a liquid account until the housing market returns to normal. Should I do a ladder CD, money market account? I just don't know. So uh, money market uh, interest rates and savings account interest rates are going to decline at a meaningful a rapid clip as the economy is slowed and the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates uh, repeatedly over the next who knows how long that will be. So the savings rates will follow lower. And so if you expect that it's going to be a while till you're going to buy the home, then I'd want you to lock in at CD rates before CD rates go down a whole lot more. Because all you'll do is you'll watch those rates on uh, high, what they call high yield savings accounts, or on money market accounts, they'll they'll steadily trend downward. 
So that's the advantage of locking in a CD if it's going to be a decent amount of time till you're going to uh, proceed probably to buy a home. Landon in North Carolina says, my fiance has a 401k with her company and is currently contributing 2%. Her company matches up to 3% to a traditional 401k. She just got promoted and wanted to start contributing more and was wondering if she should start contributing to a Roth 401k as well. 2% in the traditional, 2% in the Roth. So Landon, uh, federal income tax rates are incredibly low right now. And unless your fiance is making a, a ton in her job, which would be amounts, um, I, I don't know whether to go, say fiance, I don't know whether to go single rates or married rates, but let's just say if she's earning less than a very large amount of money, which would be quarter million, she'd be best off doing all her contribution into the Roth 401k, nothing into the traditional. And her match is normally done as pre-tax. So she will still be contributing uh, essentially 3% of her pay through the employer match and 4% into the Roth. And I think that's plenty in traditional. I, th I just love the Roth for people in today's, uh, I know it may not feel like it when you look at the withholdings from your check, but for most taxpayers, federal income tax rates are much, much lower than they've been historically. JB in Georgia says, I've fully funded both of my kids' education with no debt. They have a combined $49,000 left in their 529 accounts. I called to inquire with our state's 529 about changing the beneficiary to myself and my wife to allow us to fully fund our Roth account each year. They stated they only allow a transfer to a new beneficiary and were not sure of the tax consequences or if this was even allowed. I thought you would be able to just change the beneficiary. Do you know if this situation is allowed? I know we can let kids have the our kids have the Roth, but we made sacrifices and thought using it toward our retirement would be better. So JB, when, uh, gosh, we're back to Congress again. When Congress passed this provision to increase parents' funding, 529 plans, and if a kid didn't go to college, not getting eaten up by taxes and being able to migrate up to 35 grand under today's rules over time into a Roth IRA, Congress anticipated exactly what you're talking about, a parent changing a kid's 529 to themselves as beneficiary and then migrating money for themselves into a Roth. And so there's a provision in there where you can't do anything with conversion for 15 years to prevent a parent from doing this as a backdoor way of shoving money into a Roth. So there are a bunch of provisions that are uh, still not completely clear about the transfer and then going to a Roth because the whole intention was that the money would go to your kid who was the beneficiary of the 529 plan or your kids and that you would do with the 49000 migrated over time into a Roth IRA for them from the 529. So uh, it's, it's done specifically to prevent parents using it as a um, backdoor financial planning tool of getting extra money into their own Roth. Yeah, my understanding was um, looking this up that it's open for that beneficiary for 15 years, right? For that specific beneficiary, that account right. has been Right, so, so if you so change... Really, yeah, you'd so have to wait 15 more 15 years. 15 more yeah. years before you could do this for yourself. So you can change the beneficiary from one of your kids to yourself, but it means that you're sitting here till uh, 2039 at the earliest before you could start migrating any of that money into the Roth for yourself. So it, it just makes more sense to let that money flow to your kids and hopefully they will uh, remember and not just appreciate and if you need financial help later in life that they'll be there for you knowing also my late father's rule that one parent can take care of 10 kids but 10 kids can't take care of one parent 
So uh, coming ahead, I want to talk about something that you need to know about insurance that is so important to protect your yourself financially. You know, some people think of insurance as just something that's a have to because you're made to. Um, but there are specific reasons why you want to protect your assets with insurance. And there's something you got to know, I'm going to tell you straight ahead. I shared a story with you two years ago about a uh, very wealthy doctor who got wiped out because his teenager had a terrible accident. It was the teenager's fault. And this very successful doctor had state liability minimums. This accident occurred in the state of Florida where the doctor lived. And the doctor who'd spent up, uh, built up wealth over a lifetime was completely wiped out because it blew past, obviously, the state liability minimums, which are a joke. And the doctor ultimately being sued and losing because of the accident that was the daughter's fault, all the assets got wiped out. The doctor has to start all over rebuilding financial security. What would it have cost the doctor to prevent this? Not very much money. Although we've had many complaints from people about, obviously, the big run-up in auto insurance premiums, particularly for the liability side of auto insurance. And then on top of it, so many people who have umbrella insurance policies, people who I call umbrella insurance a success tax. If you have developed meaningful assets in your life, you have what are called uncovered assets. You have a home with a lot of equity, or you're one of the roughly 30% of people who own your home free and clear. Uh, you, uh, you have money in investments. You have money in retirement accounts. All that could be at risk from an insurance claim. So right now, there's been this movement by people who own their houses free and clear. They're saying, I'm not going to insure it anymore. Look how much the homeowner's insurance is. And, and they just self-insure. And then having on auto insurance, having state liability minimums because it gets you a lower premium because the premiums were going up and you're like, I hate paying these higher premiums. So I'm going to go to minimums. You know who's okay with minimums? Somebody who doesn't have money in investments. You're a renter, not an owner. You are what's referred to in the legal trade as essentially judgment proof. You got nothing that if there was an accident you were held liable for, you got nothing people can get. Somebody gets hurt at your property. If you're renting, it's not your property, it's the landlord's property. On the other hand, if you own a house, somebody gets hurt at your house, then you can get sued for an enormous amount of money. Somebody gets hurt in an accident that you're found to be at fault at or even partially at fault at. You can end up owing a lot of money. So resist this temptation that's so in right now to reduce or eliminate insurance coverage in your life. Because the problem is what you're exposing yourself to if you've created meaningful assets in your life. Umbrella policies are, as I've heard complaints from people, more expensive than they used to be. But for what you get, it's essentially dirt cheap. So might typically have, I used to say, if you had an umbrella policy, which the base policy is a million dollars of additional liability coverage on top of your auto and homeowners coverage. And I used to say it would cost you $200, $250. Today, in a lot of states, a lot of insurers, maybe more like $350. $350 a year to protect a million dollars in assets you have, it's not very much money. And if you have a lot of money, each additional million is cheaper than the one before to protect with an umbrella policy. 
I am a big believer in these. And I don't want you, if you have, a, this is why I call it a success tax. If you have managed to have a lot of financial success in your life and you're living on less than what you make, so you have net, really wonderful assets, you also need a wonderful level of umbrella insurance. And if you own things, like you own a lot of equity in your home or something like that, and you're driving around with state liability minimums on your auto insurance, don't do it. Don't do it. You're playing roulette. Other day, I was um, in traffic at a red light. And uh, I grew up in the South. We don't call them traffic signals. We call them red lights because they always seem to be red. Anyway, light turns green. Lane on either side of me starts moving. And it's weird about what happens is you think, okay, it's time to go. Well, the person in front of me must have been looking at their phone or something. And I almost ran into the back of them. The car set off those alarms. And I stopped, I don't know, like a, a, a fraction of an inch from hitting them. And you think about all the days you're just driving around and you think, um, think nothing's going to happen to me today. And then, bam, it does. And I could have very easily been in an accident then. And then there's the exposure to liability where somebody even at five miles an hour says, oh, man, I have all these soft tissue injuries. I can't believe what happened to my neck. I saw that, that commercial for this lawyer. I'm calling him. you got to have the protection because you never know what's going to happen. Okay. This question came in from Cindy in Florida. When we shop at Lowe's, we enjoy their military discount. When they required that we establish our eligibility through ID me, I dutifully did that. However, now when I check out at the store, rather than just look at my ID to verify that I am who I say I am, they want to scan my driver's license. I find I'm uncomfortable with that. Am I being unreasonable? And should we be concerned about merchants scanning our driver's licenses? You know, I don't like this thing. There are these uh, driver's license readers that are appearing like rapid fire all over the place now because of all the fake IDs and all that. So you're, you're getting a privilege. You're getting this discount from Lowe's. And they obviously have had problems with people that are pretending to be who they're not to get the discount. So I hate that this stuff goes into a database. You have to always judge, though, the value of the discount that you're getting and uh, thank you for your service, by the way, versus paying a higher price and not handing over the driver's license to be scanned in, I would say the discount, which is a certainty, is worth getting for the possibility, which I think would be low, somebody misuses that information from your driver's license. Amanda in Florida says, my husband and I have about $45,000 in credit card debt. We bought our house at the right time and have some equity and a low interest rate. I wanted to cash in my 401k to pay off our credit card debt, but my husband wants to take out a home equity line of credit to consolidate the debt. Which is the smarter way to go? For reference, we owe $216,000 at 2.8% interest on an FHA loan. The Zillow estimate of our house is $345,000. My 401k has $60,000 in it, so I could get about thirty-eight k after taxes and penalties. So, Amanda, you asked me a very linear question. Should uh, you liquidate your 401k, pay the tax and penalties on it, and pay off this credit card debt, or you'd be able to pay off most of it with what you'd net? Or should you do the home equity line of credit? With that linear choice you gave me, I'm with your husband, that doing the home equity line of credit would be preferable, but I actually bring up a third alternative. If you have $45,000 in credit card debt, I don't know what your total income is together, but that's a pretty uh, uncomfortable number. And... I'm worried that if you take out the home equity line, you now have put your home more at risk. 
you have less equity in the home, yes, you would have a lower interest rate on the equity line than you have right now on the credit cards. But I'm worried that if you're deficit spending, that what happens is the credit cards start creeping up again in balance, that you don't pay them off and just be done with them. I would really prefer for you and your husband to go sit down either virtually or in person with a legit credit counselor at an affiliate of the uh, NFCC, the National Foundation on Credit Counseling, to see if there are things you need to do about your finances so that you don't end up in a situation with that level of credit card debt again. I mean, the question you asked, the answer is really clear to me. The home equity line is a better idea. But the home equity line may not be the right idea when you look at the larger picture. And that's why I want the two of you to sit down with a budget person and see what's going on with your money. Micah in Maine says, recently I received an email from my credit card company telling me, or it's actually a bank, telling me that they added oh, pays. Oh, go ahead. I, in this case, please This name one was them. Capital One. They yeah. added pays, P-A-Z-E, to my account. I immediately called and said to remove it. Customer no service and the supervisor had no idea what I was talking about and said it's a third-party service. That's why I want you to say Capital One, because it's not a third-party service. Capital One is one of the owners of pays. This require and so they told me to opt out through the email, which included an opt out option. This required me sharing my phone number or email with Pays, a company I want no part of. I make sure that none of my banks are allowed to share my information with third parties. I escalated with Capital One and received a call back three weeks later saying that it was a third party service and the email did not opt me in. I explained they were wrong. This indeed was an automatic opt in as the only option was an opt out link. I said they were in violation of federal law by sharing my information with the third party, and I was told it was part of their terms of service, which is clearly incorrect as I opted out. I see this is happening with many other banks. How can we stop this? Okay, so, Micah, what's going on here is Pays is not considered to be a third party service. Even though you would have opted out of sharing with third parties, because Capital One is one of the owners of Pays, which I don't want you using. And I have a write-up at Clark.com about all the reasons Pays is something you should not use. All right, so P-A-Z-E, Pays, which you're going to get propaganda from uh, potentially your bank or credit union telling you this is the greatest way for you to take your phone and tap to pay. What's going on is the banks are terrified of the non-bank apps, Apple Pay and Google Wallet. They feel like they're losing connections to their customers, which is true. And Apple Pay and Google Wallet are set up, the architecture is so brilliant and the security features embedded in them so good that the banks are beyond terrified of financial connections being with, for people on iPhones, Apple Pay, Androids, through Google Wallet, that they rushed out this alternative saying, this is really how you should do things, and uh, you shouldn't use the, uh, they don't, I don't think they necessarily say, this is so much better than Apple Pay or Google Wallet, but that's the implication. So they haven't been getting any market share take up. So now, uh, at least in the case of Capital One, don't know others, they're forcing it onto their checking account customers. And so the best thing to do, Micah, just don't use it. Just don't use it. And the banks are cowards. The banks are absolute cowards. The stuff that goes on with Big Bad Zell and now with Pays, the banks see other people come up with a better way to do things potentially, and then they come up with their own convoluted cockamamie solution to try to muscle in, and when that doesn't work, force it on customers. And you have to know, be savvy enough to know this is what's going on and stand up for yourself. It's your money. It's your wallet. 
And I appreciate if any banker wants to have a rebuttal to talking so badly about you, pushing this junk on people, my words, and I always am willing and open to hearing an alternative response, and we also have the forum at clark.com slash clarkstinks. I want to tell you that we are here for you. That's what this is about. And my goal in life is to give you tools that give you the power, the knowledge, so that you save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. And we'll do more of that same thing tomorrow on our podcast and YouTube show. See you tomorrow.